Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome back to um, CBI at 10. Um, it's Wednesday, the 27th of January. I sound like a newsreader. Um, my name is Liz Mosley, and I'm an editor and partner at Tortoise. And we're joined this morning by Matthew Fell, who many of you will recognise, and Alice Williams and Charles Alberts. So I'll come and introduce Alice and Charles shortly, but thank you very much for um, being here. And today we're going to try and have a conversation about um, the people in our organisations and how they are doing, and indeed how we are all doing, um, and responsibilities um, for business leaders to look after people in the most extraordinarily challenging situation of the pandemic. And before we get into the meat of today's conversation, um, I'll start with Matthew, as is customary for these webinars, for a, just a sort of brief update um things people need to know things that have changed in the last seven days since we got together matthew is there anything new that people need to have on their um, radar in terms of the government response or, or new information w what's gone on in the last week yeah well that th thanks liz and uh, good morning everybody um, just a few quick updates from me to kick us off i guess um we're all firstly i think just digesting the the very sobering news that the uk has obviously passed now 100,000 deaths as a result of COVID. So that just as a reminder, uh, just what an impact this pandemic is having on people's lives. And um, a little bit more encouragingly, perhaps around the vaccine strategy, I think that does seem to be progressing well. 6.8 million people now having received their first dose. That's over three quarters of the over 80s population, well over 10% of the UK population altogether. And just to reassure people, we are speaking privately to government around what the phase two of that vaccine rollout looks like. So once you get beyond the elderly and the vulnerable groups and so on, what is a sensible sort of next steps? Should you prioritize, for example, key enablers such as schools, transport and so on? Those thoughts are very much taking place. And then there's maybe the third bit just to mention from me would be we are increasingly giving thought to uh, a roadmap around reopening uh, the economy. Um, absolutely not to try and second guess the sort of health backdrop or to try and pick a fixed date. I think sort of therein, therein lies madness in a sense when you can think you could accurately predict this stuff. But actually to just to make sure that business and government are really collaborating closely on these issues, doing that behind the scenes planning so that everybody is prepped. There's no surprises when it does come ready and the time is right to begin to think about reopening the economy. How are we going to do it? So to help with planning, align time horizons and give everybody a sense of direction and that might include things like you know what's a shared joint view on the right sequencing do we reaffirm the tiering approach for example being clear on the conditions that need to be met before any restrictions can be rolled uh, back what's the plan for testing and vaccines in workplaces and so on and what does that enable you to do more than we can do today probably some detailed plans for the genuinely hard to uh, hard and tricky sectors like international travel, live events and so on, where there's plenty of close contact and so on. And also, how do we underpin all of that with some sensible tapering of the economic support so we avoid cliff edges in terms of job support, loan schemes and so on. So if we can bring all of that together in a sensible uh, roadmap style approach, we do feel that would give a bit of direction to people. We'll be writing out to CDI members later this week with a few thoughts on that, and we would love feedback as to what firms would find particularly useful about that. So I think, Liz, that's probably the, the key thing on my uh, to-do list uh, for the week. Just that small matter of figuring out how to end the lockdown, Matthew, you should be able to rattle that off, no problem. Just give a sense that people, I think it's important that they know that you want the input from members. I think that's hugely key. What's the sort of timeline that you're looking at to get something like that, a sort of roadmap draft out into the world? Well, exactly. I mean, I think Liz, if people are able to give us any thoughts on that, just drop us a line at the sort of the, the COVID support regular email box. We'll pop it in the chat as well. But um, over the next week or so would be terrific if people have got thoughts on what would you most find useful to give you a sense of sort of direction and help your own individual company planning and so on. OK, thanks very much. I hope that people will um, take the opportunity to do that. And it's a good segue really into the next part of this morning's conversation, because this sort of sense of an ending and not knowing when when it's going to be and how it's going to feel. I think it's one of the main factors, that and the weather, that is making this phase of lockdown particularly grim. Um, 
I, that's my sense from lots of people. Um, I certainly feel it myself that it's just been the longest January that there has ever been. Um, and it's really, really tough. It's financially tough. It's personally tough. It's emotionally difficult. It feels like a slog. What, just tell me a little bit, Matthew, about what the CBI is hearing from its members, what you as an organisation have been doing to sort of try and get through this this really horrible bit that we're in now. Yeah, that's how it is. Well, I think you, you've sort of accurately captured the mood music there. I think um, that is very much the sense I get from speaking to both people as individuals and, and our members as businesses collectively. Um, I think you have hit the, the issues on the head, but the, there's a point about sort of resilience is wearing a bit thin just because of the duration. You know, we've been at this for the best part of 12 months now, so that is clearly a factor. I think um, for individuals, the fact that we're in a lockdown in winter as opposed to summer makes quite a significant difference as well, just in terms of what you can physically get out and about and do and so on. Uh, and then thirdly, I think particularly true for people who've got um, uh, sort of working families, who've got um, homeschooling and so on going on. There was a little bit of a sense speaking to a few people that um, in the summer, it was almost almost the end of term and the sort of summer holidays were sort of coming over the horizon and provide a little bit of sense of relief, even though there was still the childcare issues. But now yeah. it's sort of January, it feels like it's stretching out quite a long way as well. So a combination of all those factors do make it tough. And then I think the where we're pointing to people and hopefully we'll give a bit of people guidance on this webinar this morning is, um, I think there's a set of issues around prioritizing mental health and well-being. The specific issues for people who are either working parents and those with additional caring responsibilities right now and then maybe some general thoughts on, on sort of flexibility so maybe to pick those off in turn i think firstly in starting with mental health you know this has been an issue right from the start of the pandemic but this third lockdown for all the reasons we've just said feels like it's even more important this time around so i think our advice to business is is firstly just make sure you really understand the situation that's going on in your workplaces. And this is done through a combination of sort of semi-formal, either well-being surveys or employee pulse checks, testing the mood music with different employee groups and networks, for example, uh, including with people in different places, different groups and so on. And above all, I think making sure that managers are speaking to their teams and individuals in those teams more than ever just to really understand the situation. So that will be point one. Second, I think then we're, we're urging and, and advocating firms, create a plan that's specific to your own organisation. Um, that might include uh, mental health champions or first aiders. Absolutely, it would include training your line managers to know what to look out for and how to help in these situations and reviewing your staff benefits and other support measures to make sure can they be tweaked or tailored uh, in some way that helps with the particular backdrop right now. And then the third bit I would say, Liz, is really just put an extra effort into maintaining a strong team culture and organisational culture right now. And gosh, we know that is difficult. It's a, it's a real stretch. But making sure there is time set aside for the non-work catch-ups, finding people. And, you know, we've got to find a colleague piece of work, people who live by close by. You can do socially distanced walks and things like that. So, different examples but find a plan that works for your own uh, organization there's plenty of support and materials out there we're going to put some of that in the chat as we go through this morning's uh, webinar for people to dive into a couple of other bits then uh, away from the mental health specifically i think working parents and carers again a real issue uh, in the pandemic and something else that's further on the rise fairly similar advice there in many respects uh, start by just mapping and understanding the situation. Identify those employees who've got additional caring responsibilities right now, and then start to put some proactive measures in place. Um, enable more flexible working and changes to working hours where that is possible and where people would benefit from it. Um, apply and adapt your regular either annual or unpaid leave policies. Some companies we talk to are going above and beyond that. I spoke to a manufacturing firm who's doing a matching sort of principle, essentially, if individuals are taking a day's leave for caring responsibilities, they're matching that on a like for like basis, for example. Some companies, it won't work for everybody, not everyone wants to do this, but are using the furlough scheme uh, for um, uh, people who are either doing homeschooling or have got caring responsibilities. That option is available to businesses. And then I'd underpin all of that just by fostering a culture, really, that welcomes working families. And I think there's a lot of an issue here around just making sure managers 
understand flexible working hours, uh, reprioritizing work where possible, and also making sure people don't feel guilty. I, I've heard this theme come up an awful lot, that people feel like they're passing the burden or passing the load on to people who don't have caring responsibilities, and just making sure that is all talked through with, with plenty of flexibility and so on. And that maybe brings me on to my, my final thought, really, which is just that flexibility, I think, is the watchword throughout all of this, and it plays both ways, uh, many different situations. We know that uh, sickness absence is significantly higher now, of course, than it is in normal times. Go to a utility company, it's running at about sort of 7% as opposed to 2% norms for absences. If that hits 10%, it gets really very difficult for them in terms of scheduling work and so on. So I think there is a bit of give and take uh, all around on this. And then particularly when it comes to the vaccine, I think flexibility is really welcomed there. Lots of people I know are keen to volunteer. So I think we're encouraging companies to make that as easy as possible for firms, uh, for individuals uh, where they wish to do that. And of course, when it time comes to uh, people receiving the vaccine, uh, again, being as flexible as possible so that people are able to go and do that. So those would be the thoughts, Liz, around some specific plans and actions around mental health. Uh, making sure that we look after people who uh, have got additional caring responsibilities and flexibility is perhaps the sort of thread that runs through it all. Brilliant. Thanks ever so much, um, Matthew. I'm going to come to Charles in a second because I know Alice is, is struggling a bit with sound, so hopefully she will rejoin. But just as a reminder to the people here um, listening this morning, if you have questions, you can submit them and we would really like for you to do that just so that we can answer specific things you're thinking about if you have insights to share of things that you've tried that have been particularly successful that would be great to hear too and if you want to submit a question anonymously you can just do that if you just put anon before you type your question so do use the questions function so i'll come to um charles um charles alberts your um head of well-being solutions at, at aon and you're you're a big company you've six and a half thousand people in the uk and ireland is that right that's right yes so you've got a lot of people to worry about and look after um, in the context of your well-being remit. And obviously you work with client organisations as well, partner organisations. Just give us a sense of what the sort of top three or so kind of pinch points are, either within Aon or that you're hearing inbound from the people that you work with. What are the things that need to be on people's radar? Sure, no worries. Um, th thanks, Liz, and uh, good morning, everyone. It's uh, it's great to be here with you uh, today. I mean, I think I think Matthew's spoken about it, but but I think we need to recognise that you know, with this third lockdown, um, it's suddenly gotten a lot tougher for a lot of people. I think before the 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 timing of this was uncertain, but now it feels ongoing, like we're in it for the long game, and. The issues that people have been, you know, facing um, for, you know, nearly a year now uh, haven't really changed. Things around, you know, job insecurity, um, people are having financial worries, uh, feeling isolated and uh, and lonely, uh, worrying about their health and, and, and the impact of, of COVID and, and, and getting unwell. And of course, we've also seen people's treatments being delayed as well. So either NHS treatments being postponed or as the private sector hospitals um, resources have been allocated to 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 um, help the uh, and support the, the NHS. Um, that's had an impact on conditions such as you know cancer, for instance, which is incredibly concerning to many organizations that, that we work with. We've also seen um, organization behavior change slightly around support of um, health of their employees and we've seen a reduction in the number of occupational health referrals as people are not you know many people are not in the office and uh, and at home so that's just kind of from my perspective I think a little bit of context around some of the issues that um, you know that, that that we and clients that, that we work with are, are grappling with I think you know mental health undoubtedly has been um, so prevalent um, in this time we're starting to talk a lot more about our mental health and well-being which I think is a real positive thing but unfortunately it's as a result of our mental health deteriorating over this period we've mm -hmm. seen the ONS report that you know rates of depression have doubled um, in this in the summer last year we've also seen the health and safety executive report that um, that that cases of work related uh, stress, depression, and anxiety had a 40% increase to the year to the end of um, March 2020. Now that's before um, the lockdown, 
and a number of organizations are coming to us with a concern around um, around suicide risk as well there's a general awareness and real eagerness to try and do as much as we possibly can to protect people's mental health and prevent suicide as much as uh, as we can and just finally the the, the other issue that uh, we're talking more and more about is this concept of presenteeism which is when people come to work when they are unwell and not performing well as they should be. So we're seeing absence rates dropping in many organizations uh, throughout this period, partly because pe people are you know, at home and perhaps slightly under the radar. But there's this issue of presenteeism, which has a big impact on organizations and their mm -hmm. productivity that we need to start to tackle. Certainly that sense of the book ending of the day has kind of gone um, and if you were somebody who used to travel to work then that sort of the, the the working day has just sort of eked out and all of that time has just become work time sort of it's it's very odd feeling actually not to have a sense of a, a gear change between am I doing breakfast with the kids and or am I doing a meeting with my boss it's an odd sort of feeling that those two things just become one one sense together. Um, thanks, Charles. I, I will come back to you in a second because there's a couple of details I want to pick up. I'm going to go to Alice while you're there and you can hear us because I'm fearful that we'll lose you again. Um, yeah. Alice, um, your, your <laughs> VP, um, strategy at, at Schneider Electric, and, and again, you're a large organisation, four and a half thousand people in the UK and Ireland, and a complex mix of people. I think I fall into the trap sometimes when I'm having these conversations about workplace wellbeing that I assume I sort of default to office based, but your organization has a real mixture of, of different ways of working. Just help us understand a little bit what how that's affected your response to, to looking after people through the through the pandemic. I don't know yeah, absolutely. And hopefully I can touch on some of yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, sorry. Have you got me? Yeah, we got you. Perfect. Um and hopefully I can touch on some of Charles's filters there around the mental health piece. So we've got um, an organization that currently about 3,000 of us are working from home, completely from home. We've got about 300 who we probably consider connected office space, but they have certain needs to go into the office, either personal or business essential needs to do some of that work from an office. And then we've also got a large field service engineer so these are our guys and girls who are out on customer sites, keeping all of their critical infrastructure maintained. So working with data centers in hospitals to make sure all their electrical infrastructure keeps running. Uh, and we do also have nine manufacturing uh, and distribution sites within the UK. So um, a large number of our employees who are day to day going in, uh, actually us having to work around proximity because is things like your normal first aid and how you lift heavy items together and that sort of stuff obviously we have to consider when we're also thinking around two meter rules and ppe etc so yeah. a really fine balancing act required between the different groups whilst trying to keep everyone feel together as a whole um, in the organization um, the interesting thing i guess as charles spoke uh, is is you know the the impacts that this is having on people and being really clear that there isn't a silver bullet and we have to do a lot of different things and we have to look at it in a lot of different ways, enable people at every level, but also really use the experts. Um, and so for us, we have leaned heavily on and I hope we've also supported really meaningfully the Electrical Industries charity, um, who for us, it's fascinating, you know, they they have a history of supporting colleagues in our field with quite often that kind of remote nature of work, working in high risk, highly volatile environments on their own, which actually they're translating beautifully across to all of these different um, people and thinking about how the impact is different, but there are similarities in terms of how you can handle it. Yeah, really interesting. I think looking for help and asking for help from people who do know, weirdly, is something that doesn't instinctively come to us first as an idea for how to get through a problem sometimes with things like this but there is support and help out there and I can see that Alice um, Grimes and the CBI is sharing links to various different support resources that have come from the CBI but certainly that's a really good um, piece of advice. Um, Matthew touched in his sort of opening gambit about this notion of culture and trying to keep people together and making time for sort of 
doing non-work things. Um, and I've heard people talk a lot about that from the very beginning, actually. And quite often it comes down to this um, to this sort of nebulous group of people whose name is called managers. Managers need to step up and do more and sort of be more on top of it. I wonder if, Charles, you might sort of comment a little bit about you know, there's no such thing as managers. That's just people and they have different sizes of teams and their different ways of working and different degrees of access to the people they work with. How have you supported that group of mysterious group of people called managers to do that thing, which is be empathetic, be kind, listen, ask, find out about people's personal situations? I mean, that's you could spend all your whole day doing that and never do your job. What's your advice and guidance for people who are trying to think, how do I cascade this culture thing through my organization? Yeah, I, I mean, the concept of, um, you know, line managers, uh, leaders is is really interesting because I think that we're seeing a slight shift in emphasis of, of on those roles and, and different expectations, you know, more expectations around the softer skills, which I think is absolutely the right thing to, you know, the right thing for us to do. I think as we start to change the way that line managers support their teams, you know, leadership at the very top of the organization is at the heart of it. You know, executive continuing to communicate, you know, frequently and openly with their organizations. They they set the tone and give permission for people to look after their own well-being, but also, are, you know, communicate the ask for line managers to step up and really start to understand their people you know to to show them the kindness and compassion that they need not just through this period but actually on an ongoing basis and also to be more i think more flexible um around how you how you you know support your teams recognizing that that everyone is different now that's not always easy to do i think line managers have a real tough job because you got pressure from the business on one hand you know to deliver results and then on the other hand you're trying to support your people and you know trying to be to be kind to them and I think we need to not forget that, you know, line managers are, you know, people in themselves. They are employees as well. And I think we need to we need to be conscious to provide additional support to our line managers. So even if that's something as basic as, you know, training around the soft skills that they require, that seems like uh, an obvious skill that line managers should have, but not necessarily everyone goes into the role with that. And we know that, you know, from various research studies that just having the the confidence to be able to support your team gets you most of the way, you know, there. So helping people to feel equipped to better support their teams is, is absolutely key. And does that involve, when you say helping people to feel equipped, does that involve what, training things or what, what are some of the toolkits that get people to that point? I think you know various various different training courses. I think exists around line managers, but one of the most effective ones has been around health and understanding mental health for people leaders. You know, we've seen a massive increase in the number of organisations who come to us to ask for support with training their line managers around mm -hmm. supporting employee health and well-being throughout this period. And I'm expecting you know that to be a trend that will it will continue in the future. Yeah. Thanks, Charles. Alice, do you have any builds on that with your, what have you practically done inside of Schneider Electric to sort of knit people together? It might be formal things in terms of training, it might be informal things. Just give us a sense of some of the things that you've got going that seem to be having a positive impact in looking after people and keeping people safe and happy. So I think the first and foremost thing is communication uh, and it's ambiguity which causes all this anxiety. So we've driven from the top, you know, from our zone president and all of our ex-co, being open about vulnerability and speaking about vulnerability as a leader, really important so that others feel they have the free space to do so. But also telling people everything we can and also acknowledging the things we don't know yet. And the really important thing about this is no one's an expert, none of us know how to do this. And actually being really open and saying, we don't have the answer to this piece of the jigsaw yet, but we will tell you when we do, actually gains that trust piece where people understand there is nothing hidden. You know, we're sharing everything we can. Uh, and then sort of that, that trickling down through managers. With the managers specifically, um, you know, we have, we have some great training around new ways of working. 
and a particular element of it is around managers freeing up their time and energy to be there for their team because this whole thing of how you balance productivity with your team if you get the balance right actually you can spend a lot of time around the team and they deliver the results you know happy employees deliver the results so we've done some good training around that and some real tidbits around how to block your time so we're encouraging people only ever to put in 45 minute meetings so you actually have 15 minutes at least to you know stock take potentially go to the toilet heaven forbid and all these things that no longer happen <laughs> in a fully virtual world um, and also to do more of the soft connecting so uh, we're doing a lot of sharing so there's a ton of fantastic ideas around quizzes virtual escape rooms um, tasks charity events and we're just trying to get all the teams to share because you know even if you've done one of them there's a ton of stuff that other people have done out there that means you don't have to as a manager get all of that time behind it to get it off the ground you can actually just share those resources um, which I think is really important the other thing I think we've taken the approach of is um, and you know agile is an overused phrase but letting letting the whole network spin up in an agile way so where people are compelled and they're getting behind well-being initiatives and they want to set up the mindfulness sessions or they want to do the virtual three peaks challenge actually also creating the framework where all of these teams within teams can spin is really important because the interesting thing about focusing solely on the manager is you can isolate people so if you're on a small team and you are sick of seeing the same four people all the time but everything's around your team you've got to be able to get access you know to other teams and we've got to help link different teams so you can find people with the same interests as you and you're not just you know because because with the best will in the world if you're in a small team it's going to get dull, right? So I think that's the important thing is is allowing those networks and the people who want to step into the organizer mode. We all know them, are the people who normally always organize the school get togethers and the dinners and actually just letting them charge forward with these great ideas has been really freeing. Yeah, um, I like that sort of visualization of sort of teams within teams and just letting them spin if you want to crack on and and organize a little mindfulness group or in our case a craft club there's a bread club there's a running club you know that has all happened quite organically and without any real sort of input or effort from the top it's just something that people have picked up and run with and, and they can be really disproportionately beneficial i want to just pick up a little bit on something you said alice just now which i know i absolutely know is important um but i just wonder if it really happens which is the senior person, the person at the top of the tree showing vulnerability. Um, I, I, I absolutely buy the theory, but my question is, how does that person do that? What is the forum? And 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 because because it's sort of it's sort of uncharacteristic, you know, traditionally for that for those kinds of roles for somebody to come on, I don't know, a Zoom town hall meeting in front of the whole organisation and go, well, I've had an absolute shocker this morning. You know, how does it happen? Does it really happen? I suppose is the question. Liz, my, I think my, my, my thought on that is actually so. We've been it's just about talking about normally what you're experiencing, sort of thing. You know, I mean, everyone has got the sort of challenges of balancing work and. Uh, work at home at the moment going on uh, and it is kind of a thing about um, we're all operating on these sort of zoom calls and so on and things like that you do get more insights actually funnily enough into people's sort of home lives as well as their work lives in a way that they were maybe a bit more segregated in the past mm. and I think that's maybe a route into just sort of normalizing it and so on is just talking about what's going on in a way that um, mm. I think people are increasingly comfortable with um, just a few more thoughts to move on then I think just to underscore a few bits that Alice said as well. One is that um, the power of this sort of role modeling of people, I think particularly with caring responsibilities and so on, um, the, the, the benefits of sort of dads making sure that they're showing they're taking time out as well as, uh, as, well as mums, for example, and so on, uh, and teams seeing that happening, I think is so tremendously powerful for organizations just to set the right example uh, and, and tone. And then the other bit that I would just massively underscore is um, this sort of making sure that you break out of just small teams and pools of people and, and get it going genuinely flowing right across the organization. I think that's the thing that many of us have found hardest to replicate, for example, uh, while we're all uh, working from home and so on, making sure that you don't just be um, 
talking and engaging with the same either project team or or, or your uh, or your team based group and so on but providing those cross organization connections and opportunities for those i think is a is a great shout and something that we should all be looking out for Thanks, Matthew. I'm going to come back to Charles. There's some really great examples of things people are sharing um, in the chat. Um, a couple of people have mentioned the virtual commute for those people who are used to sort of getting on the tube or on the train or on the bus to go to work and now don't have to do that, who sort of make themselves go out for a walk to sort of do that change of gear in, in their minds. It also forces you to put your coat and your shoes on and take them off again, which you would do if you were commuting in real life. And um, so I think that's quite a, a good tip. But this is a this is an important question, um, Charles, that I wonder if you can help. So um, as, as, as we said, absence is sort of easier to see when you're meant to go somewhere to be at work. But presenteeism mm. when you're at home is much harder to see. So how can you manage presenteeism? You know, we've mentioned the role modelling of the senior people and knowing that if they log off at 6.30 or 7 or whatever the working sort of frame is, that that helps but what are the ways that you can you know really make people take the breaks that they need to break not just to go to the loo as Alice said although that is something we all need to remember to do yeah <laughs> uh, really good question big question as well I think you know talking about you know take taking the breaks just as one example uh, we've just spoken about you know leaders you know visibly from the top exhibiting the behaviors behaviors that we kind of want our teams to do that's so important and I think from the conversation we've just had about you know being a bit more vulnerable you know we often talk about um, the concept of um, of lowering the waterline which I'm sure many of you have heard of so we we are essentially an ice you know an iceberg what makes us human you know very little we can actually visibly see but what really makes us you know unique in ourselves is is underneath so a lot of focus, you know, particularly in our organization has been on, on all of us lowering that water line a little bit. Let's understand one another a little bit more. And we've had some great examples of our leaders kind of sharing more and more of their, their personal lives. But in their regular communications, also, you know, visibly talking about the breaks that they take, talking about how they look after themselves, talking about, you know, the fact that they're giving permission for everyone to do the same and sharing some examples, you know, as well. I think that's that's just so, so important. And we've seen our leaders, you know, through, through an entirely new lens, which is, you know, which has been brilliant. We see them as humans, uh, which perhaps before we didn't we didn't always have. Um, presenteeism is a, is a not an easy thing to tackle. Um, mm -hmm. Important to say it can be positive and negative. So sometimes actually coming to work when you are unwell can be part of your recovery and can be a good thing for you to be amongst other yeah. people, to be socializing, to have a purpose. I think the negative pre presenteeism is when we feel like we are unable to take the time off from work that we need to. And that's often a big cultural issue. So I'd spoken earlier on about people being worried about their jobs at the moment. So job insecurity yeah. it is a big concern for people. And when you're worried about your employment, you might be less likely to take off time to recover. Now that can be counterproductive because actually taking the time off means you can get back to work a lot quicker um, as well. So it's a cultural issue, um, you know, line managers need to, again, be close to their teams, understand what's going on for them, you know, understand what their particular issues are, if they're facing any health problems, and then supporting them, you know, to get back to, to health. And that could be giving permission to take time off, encouraging them to to do that. And that could be there could be various barriers to people taking off the time that they need. It could be, I don't have anyone to to hand this piece of work over to. So kind of helping with that or my workload too 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 much. I'm never going to be able to, you know, get back on top if I if I take time off when I when I come back come back from work. But also signposting. So you know, I, I think one of the things um, that uh, that I'm expecting of line managers nowadays is to have a better understanding of the various benefits, services, and support that's available in the organisation, and to be that person that can then hold the employee's hand to make mm -hmm. sure that they're to, to the right place. And that could be, you know, mental first aid, as we mentioned earlier on. It could be the EAP. It could be private medical insurance if you you offer that for for your employees. And I think by doing that, you're ultimately giving people the permission to 
go get better and come back to work when you're ready to. Yeah, thanks, Charles. Um, a, quite a specific question. Um, it, so it might be one for Matthew, but um, and this is very pertinent in the place where I where I work, where there's lots of people who are on staff, or a few people that are on staff, and lots of people who are contractors or freelancers or that sort of thing. And and sometimes, if you're a freelancer, even if you're a sort of quite a high intensity freelancer who's worked with the organisation for a long time and does you know three days a week or something, you can get missed off. The little things like the company WhatsApp group and the important things like the proper onboarding process and those sorts of things. Is there a sense, are there guidelines or anything like that, requirements even for what the duty of care is between an employer who's a sort of contractor where the relationship isn't on staff, basically, Matthew? Yeah, it's a, it's a good chat. I'm not sure the sort of requirements and, and guidelines in that sense. I think it is, it's, it's a great shout, but just one that's been holding on us all just to make sure that is the case and um, that people are involved and included. And, you know, I think we even have this in pre-COVID times. It's the classic thing, you know, do you get um, included in the in the sort of the summer drinks or a Christmas party or the off-sites and things like that sort of thing? Um, and I think that the best safeguard against that, in a sense, is making sure that everybody feels an onus on them, not just that the that contractor has to sort of put their hand up and ask, but actually quite often the nudge and the prompt comes, I think, from people in the rest of our teams to say, oh, uh, what, what, oh have, we, have we remembered to invite um, uh, yeah. experts yeah. and so on? So, yeah. so I think, in a sense, the collective reminder is probably the best way of tackling that, not to think it's always just either on the individual or manager but if everybody has got that front of mind I think that's really helpful. Yeah thanks Matthew. I'm going to come back to Alice now. Um, before we started the webinar this morning I was sort of sharing a completely foundless uh, sense that I have in a way which is when the world gets back to something looking more like normal and when it's safe for people to return to their place of work wherever that may be I have a feeling slash fear that the dream of flexible uh, working may fizzle faster than perhaps we, we would like it to be in that a hybrid workforce where some people are in the office and other people are at home may feel a, a little bit more fraught and tense in terms of who's really influencing things, who gets their fair share of the sort of credit pie and so on than we think. And also perhaps that we've we've missed sometimes going to work and hanging out with the people we work with and the stimulation and all the other stuff we, we get. So my, my sort of hypothesis would be, we're gonna go back to work, you know, in the workplace faster than, than perhaps we, we thought. And whether I'm right or not, I, I don't know, but do you think that there is um, a sort of, there might be a change in expectations around productivity and that for many people who are working at home now, who previously went to, went to a place of work, the working day has got longer. Do you think that there's going to be an adjustment in expectation when we start losing great big slices of time off either end of the day with our commute again? Or do you think that this is it now and we're at a level of required input and output that will be maintained? Oh, Alice, we can't hear you. So this is a fantastic topic. Uh, and from our position, Oh, can you hear me now? Is that better? Yes, we can. I'll try yeah, and keep my mic. Back. So this is a fantastic topic. Cool. And and one of the things that I think we see is that in all of the things we can't control right now, the one thing we can control is how we want to work in the future. And that's something we can define. And you know, we're a company that believes in the digital transition to a sustainable future. And this for us is something we want to capture all the good lessons of and continue. So um, we've been really clear that we will be moving to a hybrid model. You know, exactly what that looks like, there's still um, fine lines between, but we've gone as far as the stock take of our real estate and how does it change our physical footprint. We've gone as far as looking at the actual productivity impact and the impact on our 2020 numbers um, right. and really not feeling concerned about um, moving to a hybrid model. And we have looked at the different combinations of things like core hours, core days, that would help us build that sense of a critical mass in the mm. office. And, and clearly, um, I, I will touch base with Matthew on his separate thing about the roadmap. Clearly, we've got to do the staged walk into that to stay safe. But for us, this is exciting. And it is an opportunity to fundamentally really commit to a new way of working. 
And interestingly, because we're global, so we're in about over over 100 countries, uh, and we've got 47 sites within the UK. So most of us are used to working with different teams all over the place like this anyway. So actually that presenteeism, you know, I, I did work in the same office as my boss, but most of the other VPs don't. And so they would join on calls anyway. So even at that level, I, I think it's something we see as exciting and we want to take all these learnings. And if anything, you know, we can't control a bunch of the Brexit stuff. We can't control the vaccination program. We can't control the rates, but this is completely within our gift. Mm. Interesting. Charles, what about you? Um, I'd agree with Alice. It's, it's really exciting. I think all of the opportunities that, you know, the potential new way of working will, will throw up. And we've really seen technology come on leaps and bounds has really enabled us to be so much more productive at home than, than ever before. Um, I, I, I would just say we need to be really cautious about some of the risks of doing you know that wholesale i think something around and um, we, we started talking about you know uh, contractors but onboarding of new employees and uh, and getting them you know uh, fully integrated into the organization understanding the culture kind of feeling the pulse of the the organization um i think that team collaboration um we've made do and and i think you know uh uh, Webex technology and, and similar is, is great, but actually it's no replacement for, for, for being together in the office. And I think there's a bit of a risk if you've got you know part of your team um, uh, dialing in remotely and part in the room. And I think, uh, Liz, you, you kind of mentioned that in your, your hypothesis as well. And I think we've got to be really conscious of that. So to try and, you know, in, in a hybrid model, make sure that everyone as far as possible, you know, can come in. And of course, there's the issues around well-being. You know, some people either don't have the facilities um, to, to work from home or the ability based on their, their space. And, you know, I'm luck, I'm really fortunate to, to have an office that I work in and I can close the door in the day. Many people, m many people don't, and, and we shouldn't forget that. So I think it's about, you know, back to that, you know, flexible approach, understanding your people, understanding different people's re requirements and and trying to accommodate that as much as you, you possibly can. Thanks, Charles. Matthew, I can see you scribbling a few notes just as we get into the last couple of minutes or so. Do you, what about some, some closing remarks? We've, we've covered a lot of ground today and this is a huge, huge issue. We couldn't possibly do justice to it really in 45 minutes. What are some of the, the most important takeaways do you think for the people on the call and indeed the support available to them via the CBI to sort of help navigate their way through some of this? Yeah, thanks, Liv. I mean, I think my, my, my single biggest takeaway from this is actually, you know, it, it is a giant topic. Um, and also, I would say there's no perfect answer through it all. You know, we've had different practical experiences, insights, Charles's company, Alice's, the CBI. We're all doing elements of it, but ones that we think work best for our organisation. So I think my single, a couple of biggest takeaways would be really one, just make sure you've worked through it and sort of try to identify what are the issues, how do they apply in my own organisational context, and have I then sort of accessed and thought the support and thought through it all in that way. So that would probably be my takeaway number one, is have I, have I thought about it thoroughly and worked through it all? And then the second would be actually just the, the power of um, leadership, role modelling, visibility of doing it. I think the more people are able to see it being done, and we can learn from peers and so on and think, oh, that's a really good idea. I could apply that and I could do, do a bit more of that, for example. The, the power of that role modeling and visibility, I think, cannot be underestimated. So, so those would be the two things that I perhaps hang on to most from the, this morning's conversation. Yeah, thanks very much, Matthew. I think if you are sitting there thinking, well, I run a business and I've I've not really made a start yet on, for example, really thinking about the mental health of the people that I'm that I'm working with, then you can sort of take comfort from the fact that um, communication doesn't have to cost a huge amount of money. Of course, it costs time and it costs effort, but it can make a really, really big difference. You know, you don't have to invest in some really elaborate, you know, training or support scheme or what have you. I think that's a really, that's a really good place to start. Um, well, it's 10.45, so time to say thank you and goodbye. And um, thank you so much to Alice um, and to Charles and as ever to, to Matthew. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this morning. I hope it was useful. Please do have a look at the resources that have been shared in the chat and we will be back um, uh, next week. Um, the webinar topics are vaccines 
the rollout on Monday and next Wednesday we'll be joined by Jess Glover, Director of General Transition at the Cabinet Office. Um, we will see you then. Stay safe, wash your hands and have a good week. Bye.